Good evening. And as 1990 draws to an end, having about as much meat left on it as a turkey carcass, welcome to my regular roundup of the films of the year. It was not, I think, a vintage year, as I'm sure certain politicians would agree, and for British production it was a very gloomy one. But we'll come to that later. For the moment, let me just point out that the ten films I'm about to list are not in any order of merit or even in any order of chronology. They're simply ten movies that I've particularly enjoyed during my long and arduous slog around the cinemas. So let's get on with the first of them, The War of the Roses, with Michael Douglas and Kathleen Turner involved in a happy marriage that turns into sadistic, destructive divorce. Now, divorce isn't really funny, but the film is blackly, savagely funny, as the couple argue and fight and even contemplate murder over who gets what. It's about how love turns to hate, and perhaps it's also about the vile extremes to which materialism, the desire for possessions, can lead people. Now, some of the dishes tonight are new, some I've no doubt made for you before. But they are all my favorite dishes, as you are all my favorite clients. <laughs> Hello, darling. Sorry I'm late. Well, I guess I better not sit too close to anybody because I have a bit of a, of a cold. Ah, flu! I'll go in and piss on the fish. Oh. Oh. Oliver, these people are my clients. You are messing with my business. I have the food editor from the post out there. Is everything all right? I would never humiliate you like this. You're not equipped to, honey. Tiff seems to be developing. I don't know if we should leave, but I definitely advise skipping the fish course. Well, war, real war, I mean, not just the continuing hostilities between men and women, figured prominently in the cinema. The running sores of Vietnam were picked over in movies like Welcome Home, In Country, Casualties of War, and the best of the bunch, Oliver Stone's Born on the Fourth of July. But the imminent cessation of the Cold War left Hollywood wiping egg off its chin with the Eastern Bloc turning its attention to domestic problems and good old Gorby, firmly established in the West as everybody's favourite Rusky, the hunt for Red October with Sean Connery as a defecting Russian submarine commander had about as much contemporary relevance as the gunfight at the OK Corral. But since it takes much longer to make a movie than it does to start a war, the cinema is always likely, when tackling current events, to reflect life as it was rather than as it is. Yet it still keeps trying. Even now in Israel, Menachem Golan, he of the Golan Depths, is making a picture about topical events in the Gulf. Don't hold your breath. It's bound to be out of date by the time it's finished. But what's not out of date and should never be forgotten is the Holocaust. What was done once can be done again, though not necessarily by the same people nor with the same victims. A strong and timely reminder of this came in Music Box, in which Jessica Lang played a Chicago lawyer, called upon decades after the event, to defend her Hungarian father, Armin Müller-Stahl, against allegations of committing anti-Semitic atrocities during World War II. The direction was by Costa Gavras, and the two main performances were superb. The bayonet was at my stomach. I pushed myself up once, and then I fell. I remember nothing else. I was told I was found on the bank of the river. Mrs. Coleman, is this the man known to you as Mishka? Yes, that is the man. No further questions, Your Honor. Your witness. No questions. Government rest. Andy, what are you doing? It's not me. It's not me, Oni. It's not me. I didn't do this. It's not me. I didn't do this to you. I am not a beast. I'm a father. I was a husband. I loved my wife, my family. 
I couldn't do this to you. And Nam Tam Tam as I get Monday kick. Monday kick. This man didn't do this. It's not me. It's not me. It's not me. It's not me. But now a moment for reflection as we look back at some of the movie news of 1990. It doesn't bear any relationship to the major subsidies that exist in Europe. Yeah, and this is the first Irish actress to win an Oscar, so it's a little bit of history. At least until after the festival, I've decided to uh, leave, leave it untied. You mean it's that been untied for two months? For two months, solid two months. Well, my third choice in this top ten is The Fabulous Baker Boys, a simple, indeed predictable tale about a couple of piano-playing brothers, Jeff and Bo Bridges, who try to revive their third-rate nightclub act by taking on a female singer, Michelle Pfeiffer. From the moment she joins them, you know where the film is headed, but it doesn't matter because where it's going is where you want it to be. Both the Bridges are first-rate and Pfeiffer, singing her numbers well enough to be enjoyable, but not so well that you wonder why she didn't turn out to be Barbara Streisand, is a knockout. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to a very special lady with a very special way of singing a song, Miss Susie Diamond. What do you switch? Pardon me. I can't tell you how thrilled I am to be here. I work at the palace ballroom, but gee, that palace is cheap. When I get home to my chilly hall room, I'm much too tired to sleep. I'm one of those lady teachers, a beautiful hostess, you know. One that the palace features at exactly a dime, a throw. Ten 
During the year, not only La Pfeiffer and come to that the Brothers Bridges, but rather a lot of other movie stars augmented their incomes by unexpectedly bursting into song on screen. Not all the results were entirely pleasing, and in some cases you feel they might have had the decency to restrict their warbling to the privacy of their own bathrooms. On the other hand, of course, you could say the same of many people who figure regularly in the pop charts. Nobody ever said you had to be able to sing to be a pop star. However, here's a reminder of some of those more or less musical movie people. You gotta love her. How can anything survive when these little minds tear you in two? What a town without pity can do. Do you remember when we met? That's the day I knew you were my pain. Oh, maybe, perhaps. And now to the next in my top ten, a film which I've never mentioned before on TV because it was inconsiderate enough to open in the summer when Film 90 was off the air. But on this programme, nothing escapes our vigilance. So let me tell you belatedly of Romuel et Juliette, a French film written and directed by Colleen Serrault. It tells of a high-powered Parisian businessman, Daniel Auteuil, who's being double-crossed and criminally framed by two of his ambitious subordinates, while a third is having an affair with Auteuil's wife. In this frightful predicament, the only person who can help him is Fiamine Richard, the tough, independent, black cleaning lady who has five children from five different and now discarded husbands. The relationship between the yuppie Romeo and his unlikely Juliet develops from there, amusingly, delightfully and touchingly. Madame Bonaventure, je viens de divorcer d'avec ma femme. Elle est très heureuse avec Poulain. Je lui laisse tout, elle manquera de rien. J'ai acheté une maison à la campagne, pas loin de Paris, pour vous et vos enfants. Et je viens vous demander humblement si vous voulez bien m'épouser. Comment Un jour, vous m'avez demandé si ça m'était arrivé d'aimer vraiment quelqu'un. Et j'avais pas répondu. Parce que je savais pas. Maintenant, je sais. Maintenant, j'aime vraiment quelqu'un pour la première fois de ma vie. Alors écoutez, monsieur Blindé, vous avez habité chez moi. D'accord Je vous ai sorti de vos embêtements. À un moment, je vous ai demandé de m'aider et vous n'avez pas pu le faire, d'accord Vous avez eu des remords. Vous avez été très gentil. Et dans un moment de faiblesse, vous et moi, on a couché ensemble, d'accord Eh bien, vous voyez, cette histoire, elle s'arrête là. D'accord Elle est terminée, l'histoire. Terminée, vous comprenez Terminée. Je vous aime. C'est ça, j'en parlerai à mon cheval. Je veux vous épouser. C'est ça, m'épouser. Puis quoi encore Vous croyez qu'on épouse des gens comme ça Est-ce que je veux, moi Ça vous intéresse Mais moi, je ne veux pas de vous, moi. Pourquoi vous ne voulez pas de moi Il demande pourquoi. Mais parce que vous êtes blanc, monsieur Blindé. Parce que vous êtes un patron, tout ce qu'il y a de patron. Parce que vous êtes un type à qui on ne peut pas faire confiance une seule seconde. Parce que vous prenez tous les gens pour votre boniche. Parce que vous n'êtes même pas foutu de porter un fil à approvisionner de la vue de malheureuse assiette. Parce que vous avez de la gadoue plein les yeux. Parce que vous croyez qu'on peut tout acheter. Parce que vous avez pris tous les jours le grand lit pendant que moi je me crevais la peau avec mon boulot, mes cinq gosses, et encore faire vos commissions et vous sortir du pétrin. Parce que je vous emmerde, M. Romuald de Blindé. Parce que je préférerais crever la gueule ouverte que de vivre un seul jour avec un type comme vous. And those are just his good points. Sadly, during the course of the year, there was still no sign of a cure for that awful Hollywood disease, congenital sequelitis. Penicillin hasn't done the trick, 
and obviously the guys and gals are not practicing safe filmmaking because they broke out in a positive rash of recurring diehards, gremlins, back to the futures, reanimators, delta forces and even basket cases. But there was the odd touch of originality, in one case spectacularly provided by David Lynch with his weird on top Wild at Heart, a bizarre, explosive, shocking, stunning, rambling road movie that starred Nicolas Cage and Laura Dern and won the Palme d'Or at Cannes. Sailor! What are we going to do? I don't know, honey, but we gotta help that girl. Get her to a town. I hope no one catches on I broke parole. I got, I got a bobby pin. There's a bobby pin. <laughs> I can't find it. My mother's gonna kill me. It's got it's got all my cards in it, and, and it was in my pocket. <laughs> no, my pocket's gone. You gotta help me find it. My mother's gonna kill me. It, it, it's got all my cards in it, and 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 it, and it was in my pocket. It was it was in my pocket. <laughs> my purse is gone. My purse is gone. Now she tells me. Now she tells me. Let's get a hold of her quick. You think she's gonna make it? I don't know, but she's gonna bleed all over our car. I'll tell you that. Hey. Hello? Girl! You gotta come with us, honey. Leave me alone! Robert! Robert! <laughs> Shit. I've got this damn sticky stuff in my hair. I've got this sticky stuff in my hair. You better come with us, honey. Come on. I gotta find my wallet. Don't say one word of this to my mother, please. Please. God, she's gonna kill me. You can't worry about that. You got... Oh, oh God. Where's my hair, bro? God, she's dying right in front of a sailor. Now, I can't really detect any particular trend in the cinema this year. A few trendettes, perhaps, one of which I'll come to later. Budgets inevitably went soaring up into outer space. Die Hard 2 was reputed to have cost $70 million, while Total Recall, in which Arnie Schwarzenegger proved once again that he's not so much an actor as a kind of human special effect, came in at about $65 million. And rumour has it that the forthcoming Godfather 3 will be the world's first $100 million movie. But then, an ordinary, modest, Hollywood-made domestic comedy costs $20 million these days. Nice then to be reminded by the Oscar-winning success of My Left Foot, with Academy Awards for Daniel Day-Lewis and Brenda Fricker, that there are better ways to make good films than by simply throwing money at them. Still on the financial side of things, Hollywood's takeover by Japan continued. To date, four major Hollywood studios are in Japanese hands. Otherwise, I suppose, and getting away from grown-up talk about money, 1990 was the year of the comeback. John Travolta, who seemed to have vanished into some kind of black hole, re-emerged in Look Who's Talking. Marlon Brando had his biggest role for several years in The Freshman, as well as a strong cameo in Dry White Season. Richard Gere, of whom more in a minute, revived an apparently moribund career with Internal Affairs and Pretty Woman. Audrey Hepburn turned up memorably for a moment or two in all ways. Whoopi Goldberg, who hadn't had a good review since The Colour Purple and had almost forgotten what they looked like, received several of them for her performance in Ghost. And Warren Beatty, who seemed to have been mortally wounded by Ishtar three years ago, gave himself the kiss of life as director and star of Dick Tracy. Old actors may die, but they hate to fade away. And they've developed this disconcerting habit of cropping up again just when you least expect them and when you think you've seen the last of them. However, at this stage, let's hear from Tom Brook about what's been going on in America these last 12 months. Oh, my love, my darling, I've in the next few days, Hollywood will begin to tally the overall takings at the box office in 1990. The final figures should bring some good New Year cheer to the money-minded moguls at the big studios. Hollywood has had its second best year in history, which should make them all really happy. I mean, we're talking about $5 billion. I mean, this could support several small countries. Two for the phrase, please. $15. Although money has been pouring into the box office at a fairly rapid rate, Many American moviegoers have been disappointed by the quality of films in 1990. I didn't think there were that many great movies out this year. 
and the ones that were out, it was mostly the media that made you want to go see it. Then when you went to see it, it wasn't all that great. Violence. I think it's all <laughs> violence, but I guess that's what we buy. I don't know. I think 50% of the films have been just dreadful, real trash, and the other 50% have been pretty terrific. What's been notable about 1990 for Hollywood has been the triumph of the unexpected. Nothing quite worked out as planned. The films that did do well, like Ghost and Pretty Woman, came virtually out of nowhere and took everyone by surprise. And nobody can quite understand why the more predictable, tried and tested formula films, like the big action pictures, didn't perform better. Get it low! Keep over the way! The multi-million pound action films like Die Hard 2, Robocop 2 and Total Recall didn't do that badly. They just didn't make the kind of big money the studios had hoped for. The only records they did break were in bloodiness and extremely high body counts. Everybody got just a little tired of the testosterone brigade of action movies. That's all we were hearing, the hunt for Red October, uh, Eddie Murphy and Nick Nolte, heads being bashed into walls. And in 1990, a key change took place as women began to assert themselves as moviegoers. For years, the, the general wisdom has been that it was men who decided what movies men and women went to on dates, essentially. Uh, and so Hollywood has, has consistently programmed for that young male audience. Both Ghost and Pretty Woman, and Look Who's Talking too, and, and Look Who's Talking when it came out, um, are, are clearly targeted to female audiences, and they've been very, very successful. But by asserting themselves at the box office, women brought blockbuster status to fairy tale romances that many critics felt trivialized relations between the sexes. The relationship between the sexes is really in a bad way. I mean, if we look at pretty women, uh, we're seeing a hooker involved with a corporate raider, and in Ghost, we're seeing a, a woman living with a man very well in a Soho loft. And this man dies, and it's only after he dies that he learns to say, I love you. So if we're to judge by the success of these two movies, the, the way women see the ideal man is as either Donald Trump or dead. What I find even more disturbing is that women are virtually left out of movies this year. Uh, it is going to be very hard for the Academy to find five women to nominate for the best actress category this year. If Hollywood was mean-spirited by shutting out women from big roles in 1990, it certainly opened its doors to wealthy foreigners. Matsushita's recent acquisition of Universal Pictures meant that by year's end, a significant portion of America's dream factory, four of the big studios, were foreign-owned. Many in the industry began to speculate that Japanese ownership at Universal and Columbia would lead to more filmmaking geared to the international rather than domestic marketplace. I think what will happen is that American films about a specific locale, something that gets into the depths of some place, like the Midwest or something like that, will disappear. That the movies will be generalized, generic, so that they can travel well, they can play anywhere. There'll be more action, less dialogue. Uh, the, the dialogue will have a less specific and literary flavor so that it can just be shown anywhere. And uh, that's, that's my fear that they'll be making movies for the whole world and they'll be making movies for nowhere. Movie marketing certainly took new turns in 1990. Several studios began to use direct mail campaigns, sending glossy little booklets containing advertising for films to targeted groups of moviegoers likely to be interested. God, I love me! But for the most part, Hollywood marketing took place on a grand scale. Millions were spent promoting Ninja Turtles, particularly with children, while every adult was bombarded with images of Dick Tracy. 1990 was a year of relentless hype. They put out Dick Tracy clothes, they put out Dick Tracy toys, they put out Dick Tracy watches, they put out uh, all kinds of paraphernalia. And despite that, I think the idea has always been that if you put out these other things, it will help the movie. Uh, but in, in the case of Dick Tracy, at least, it didn't seem to. And the, the merchandising uh, did very badly. Critics think all the signs of incipient recession in America during 1990 might prompt Tinseltown into overdrive. In times of recession, depression, the escape is needed more than ever and so the movie business as it always has traditionally will just do terrifically and we'll get more of these fantasy comedies I and mean, ghost and pretty women aren't going away you've been warned in 1991 look out for the inevitable sequels 
probably with titles like Pretty Woman's Revenge and Ghost Part Two, The Return. But of course there'll be sequels. There are always sequels. Haven't I just said so? Well, one of the trendettes that I mentioned a while ago was for films about the supernatural, not just horror flicks like Exorcist 3, but stories of life after death. The first of them was Steven Spielberg's Always, this year's royal film, with dead pilot Richard Dreyfuss coming back to protect the holly hunter he had always loved. But what caused the rush of similarly motivated films that followed it? Films like Ghost, Heart Condition and Flatliners. Was it merely that some time back Hollywood learned that Spielberg was making a movie about life after death and reckoned that if Spielberg thought there was money in it, it was worth booking a ticket on the bandwagon? Possibly. But it's equally possible that the sudden influx of such movies reflects something else, a turning away from the gross materialism of the 1980s and towards the idea that there might be more to life than the pursuit of money. Certainly such pictures pander to the widespread interest in the occult among the young because the young make up the bulk of the audience and they're aimed too at those who wish to believe that the grave is not necessarily the end of everything. Now these are not serious films, but implicit in them is a serious thought, that no man is an island, and that the way we conduct ourselves now is also important. It's worth thinking about anyway. Besides, it has a certain application to my next choice, Denis Arcand's Jesus of Montreal. This is a French-Canadian production which uses the experiences of a young actor, Lothair Bluto, who's portraying Jesus in a passion play, to wonder how we might treat Christ if he returned to Earth today. Pretty much the same as we treated him before, is Arcan's conclusion. You are a very good actor. An actor has a need for a text. We could write you a canvas. There is a way to say that there are insignificant that is extremely popular. Think to Ronald Reagan. There are others. In all countries now, the actors are omnipresent. The television, the radio, the magazines. Il y a que des acteurs, partout. Il y a des actrices aussi. Il y a Jane Fonda. À condition qu'elle soit jolie. Mais ça, ça devrait pas t'inquiéter jamais, mon cœur. Oh, il est con des fois. 17 ans. Hi, I left a message for you. I'll call you back. Vous avez jamais pensé à publier un livre? Vous voulez dire un roman? Ouais. Ou un livre de souvenirs. Vos voyages ou votre combat contre la drogue, l'alcool, n'importe quoi. Je suis pas écrivain. Ah, je n'ai pas dit écrire un livre, j'ai dit publier. Non, des écrivains, ça, les maisons d'édition en ont qui sont disponibles, talentueux et pauvres. Évidemment. Est-ce que je vous choque? Non. J'essaie juste de vous faire comprendre qu'avec le talent que vous avez, cette ville-là est à vous. If you want. Get thee behind me, Satan. Coming up next, film number seven, if you've lost count, is Woody Allen's Crimes and Misdemeanors, in which he brilliantly weaves together two only tenuously connected stories. In one, eye specialist Martin Landau murders his mistress and learns to live with the guilt. In the other, a hapless documentary filmmaker, Woody Allen, seeks relief from his crumbling marriage in the forlorn pursuit of Mia Farrow. It's a mixture of drama, melodrama and comedy, and it works superbly. Public television wants to do a documentary on, you know, follow me around, the way I talk, the way I think, that kind of thing. So it's part of their uh, uh, Creative Mind series. So I told them about you. Oh, thank you. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm working on a thing of my own. I've been putting together a little film. Yeah, I know, I know. Wendy told me. You're trying to make a film about uh, some philosophy professor, which is admirable, that's fine. But I'm, I'm, I'm offering you the chance to earn some decent money, you know, and reach a big audience. Oh. The last thing in the world you need it's for me to be your biographer. You know, I, mean, I make these, these little films on, on yeah. you know, toxic yeah. waste yeah. and then starving yeah. children. Look, and... look, I'll be frank with you. You're not my first choice. I'm doing you strictly as a favor to Wendy. Because mm. you haven't worked in a long time. She's embarrassed. I've worked. It's just that nobody's paying me. I'm, you know, putting this film Look, together. I know you don't respect what I do. I understand that. But, you know, I got a closet full of Emmys. You, you realize that. No, all right, okay. You think that's bullshit. Fine. Okay, fine. I understand. Fine. I don't know. Maybe I could use the money to finish my movie. You know, I, I do have some debts and things. That would be idea for farce. A poor, uh, poor loser agrees to do the story of a great man's life and in the process comes to learn deep values. Three more to go, but before we move on to them, let's have a look at the top ten films at the UK box office in 1990. At ten, Parenthood, Steve Martin plays the generation game in this funny family saga. Nine, Die Hard 2, Bruce Willis finds the ghost of Christmas past turning up to haunt him on the tarmac. 
eight, Dick Tracy. Beatty's back in a colourful comic strip caper with a little help from Madonna. Seven, Gremlins 2. You were warned the first time you wouldn't listen, and now look what's happened. Six, Back to the Future 3. Time flies for the Doc and Marty McFly in the last of their time travel trilogy. At five, Total Recall. A Mars bar a day helps Arnie work, rest and slay. Four, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids, or rather, Batty Boffin Rick Moranis did. Three, Look Who's Talking. Bringing Up Baby provides plenty of chaos for caring cabbie John Travolta. At two, Pretty Woman. Richard gets into gear with happy hooker Julia Roberts. But at number one, Ghost. This literally haunting comedy was the surprise number one hit on both sides of the Atlantic. And do note that the top two films, Ghost and Pretty Woman, were both modestly budgeted and provide further evidence that turning out megabucks blockbusters is by no means a foolproof way to buy success. And while you're about it, you might also note that not a single British film figured in the top ten. But then, as I said at the start of the programme, and as we saw in the movie news, this has been a bad year for British films. Production is down and quality is down with it. A few individuals have produced excellent work. David Putnam returned to independent production with Memphis Bell. Philip Ridley showed much promise with his script for The Craze and with both script and direction in The Reflecting Skin. Nicholas Rogue did a good job with The Witches. And in America, Alan Parker directed Come See the Paradise. But apart from these and a bare handful of others, there was little else to cheer. This year, more than ever, it became clear that what Britain has is a TV film industry and that what it lacks is the money and possibly the courage to aspire to anything better. I cannot remember a more dismal year than this or one in which Hollywood's dominance of the cinema seemed more complete or more threatening. Worse still, we even seem to be losing the knack of producing outstanding offbeat pictures. Nothing from Britain was as good as Romuald et Juliette or Louis Malle's Milou in May or Kurosawa's Dreams or from Italy, The Icicle Thief. So it's back to America for film number eight, Sea of Love, a very superior thriller in which burnt-out cop Al Pacino falls in love with suspected killer Ellen Barkin. Hi. Where's your bathroom? Huh? Where's your bathroom? Where's my bag? Al Pacino, of course, was another of 1990's comeback men. Nothing at all had been heard of him since Revolution in 1984, and nothing good since Scarface the year before that, always assuming that you can call Scarface good. The crime movie and the thriller, Sea of Love being the best of them, provided, as ever, staple ingredients in the cinematic diet. And a variation on this theme, the gangster movie, also started to creep back. Next year, indeed, there'll be a positive influx of them headed naturally by Godfather 3. Meanwhile, a trio of forerunners has been among us in recent weeks. The Freshman, Steve Martin's My Blue Heaven, and by a long way top of the heap, Martin Scorsese's Goodfellas. This is based on the life of Mafia Supergrass Henry Hill, played by Ray Liotta. It's violent, shocking, and oddly moral, because what it says is that while a life of crime might be fun in the beginning, there's an awful price to be paid at the end. Terrific performances from the ferocious Joe Pesci, Ray Liotta, and Robert De Niro. Karen came to the house. She's very upset. This is no good. You've got to straighten this thing out. You've got to have calm now. You understand? With her, we don't know what the hell she's going to do. She's getting all hysterical. She gets very excited. She's wild. And you, you've got to take it easy. You've got children. I'm not saying you've got to go back there this minute, but you've got to go back. I mean, it's the only way. Got to keep up appearances. Yeah, but I got the two of them coming over the house every day, commiserating the two of them. I can't have it. I can't have it. 
You know, I just I can't do it, Henry. You know, I, it's, 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 can't do it. Nobody says that you can't do what you want to do. Yeah, do what you want to do. We all know that. I mean, this is what it is, okay? We know what it is. You have to do the right thing. You have to go home to the family, you understand? You got to go home, okay? Look at me. You got to go home. Smarten up. All right? Yeah. All right. I'm going to talk to Kara. I'll straighten this thing out. I know just what to say to her. Okay? I'm going to tell her you're going to go back to her, and everything's going to be just the way it was when you were first married. I'm going to romance. It's going to be beautiful. I know how to talk to her, especially to her. In the meantime, Jimmy and Tommy were going down to Tampa this weekend to pick up something for me. Instead, you go with Jimmy. Yeah, you come with me. We'll go down there, okay? Have a good time. Take some time for yourself. Relax. Sit in the sun. Take a couple right. of days off. Have a good time. Enjoy yourself. Sir. And when you come back, you go back to Karen. Huh? Okay. Please, there's no other way. You're not going to get a divorce. We're not on the mile. She'll never divorce him. She'll kill him, but she won't divorce him. Yeah. 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 But... So far, we've been talking mostly about the good stuff, but what about some of the stinkers of the year, the real turkeys? I won't go into detail about these because I don't think I could bear it. Having to think about some of these no-nos once was bad enough. But every now and then, and just when I'm beginning to believe that reviewing films is better than working for a living, I remind myself that I also had to sit through the likes of the atrociously pretentious Santa Sangre, John Candy and Uncle Buck, Charlotte Rampling being in love with a chimpanzee in Max Mollemour, the clumsy cavortings of Emily Lloyd and Kiefer Sutherland in Chicago Joe and the Showgirl, the ludicrous posturing Stephen Siegel in Hard to Kill, the overwrought hamming of Meryl Streep and Roseanne Barr in She-Devil, the tedium of Jane Fonda and Robert De Niro in Stanley and Iris, Mickey Rourke in The Absurd Wild Orchid, and the depressing banality of teenage mutant ninja turtles. I could go on, I promise you, but I won't because I'm feeling sick already. So if you don't mind, I'll just look the other way while we show you clips from some of the above. hotels anymore. I'm too tired to be traveling around and around. And you, you are too weak to resist temptation. <laughs> Sir, I'm this lady's husband. Get up, please. Near Papa. Nous allons pas en faire un drame. Come on, Vera, don't you want to talk about that? I ain't got nothing to say. You done insulted me, and I got to kick your ass right now. And afterwards, I don't want no hard feelings either. <laughs> oh, oh. What the f is wrong with you? You done accused me of stealing. The only thing I'm stealing out here today is your face. <laughs> you out of your f mind? Oh, yeah. And to remember, if you saw any of those, it wasn't on my recommendation. What, though, was your favourite film of 1990? Radio Times asked the question, you responded in your thousands, and your favourite movie by far was Ghost. And here's a sackful of entries to prove it. Now, the first three people whose names I pluck from here will win a year's free pass for two to the cinema. Exciting, isn't it? Just like Christmas all over again. And the winners are... Sue Barton from Kirby and Ashfield. Michelle Greenway from Hereford.
and Jill Knights from Norwich. And the Radio Times will be writing to all of you shortly. And so to the last of my ten films, which is, not to keep you in suspense any longer, not Ghost. Ghost didn't even make it into my top ten, but Pretty Woman, a modern fairy tale in which, in effect, Cinderella comes to Beverly Hills. Not only, as I said earlier, did it relaunch Richard Gere's career, but it created the only new star of 1990, the gorgeous, long-legged, wide-mouthed Julia Roberts. As is usual with people who achieve overnight success, she'd been around for a long time before this movie did the trick for her. Indeed, she was seen in three other films this year alone, Mystic Pizza, Steel Magnolias and Flatliners. But Pretty Woman was the one that made everybody sit up and say, good Lord, where did she come from? In it, she plays that legendary creature, the tart with a heart, in this case hooking up with a creature who doesn't even exist in legend, the capitalist with a heart, played by Richard Gere. It's a movie that has everything you could want from a fairy story, right down to the tears of joy at the happy ending. Yes, I am Mr. Hollister, the manager. May I help you? Edward Lewis. Ah, yes, sir. You see this young lady over here? Yes. Do you have anything in this shop as beautiful as she is? Oh, yes. Oh, no. No, no, no. I'm saying we have many things as beautiful as she would want them to be. That's the point I was getting at. And I think we can all agree with that. That's why when you came Excuse in here, you know what we're going to need here? The first. We're going to need a few more people helping us out. I'll tell you why. We're going to be spending an obscene amount of money in here. So we're going to need a lot more help sucking up to us, because that's what we really like. Oh. You understand that? Sir, if I may say so, you're in the right store and the right city, for that matter. Anything you see here, we can do, by the way. Get ready to have some fun, okay? okay. Mary Pat, Mary Kate, Mary Frances, Tova, let's see it. Come on, bring oh, it up. Absolutely divine. Excuse yeah, me, yeah. sir. Uh, yeah. Exactly how obscene an amount of money were you talking about? Just profane or really offensive? Really offensive. I like him so much. How's it going so far? Pretty well, I think. I think we need some major sucking up. Very well, sir. You're not only handsome, but a powerful man. I could see the second you walked in here, you were someone to reckon with. Hollister. Yes, sir. Not me. Her. I'm sorry, sir. I'm sorry. How are we doing, ladies? And that's it for tonight. Actually, that's it for 1990 as well. Where did the year go? I had my hand on it only a moment ago. Ah, well. I'll be back on January the 15th, and I think you'll agree that we've come up with a very good title for the new series. It'll be called Film 91. Simple, yes, but it gets right to the point. So do make a note of the date, January the 15th, and while you're jotting it down in your new Christmas diaries, I shall leave you with this montage of some of the images of 1990. Goodbye, and a Happy New Year to you all. Mm -hmm.